It's a delight to be here today with Haris and Gabe. Those of you who have been watching for a while have met both of these fine gentlemen, and uh, each of them has been working on some theories that are extremely interesting. And they decided to talk to each other in hoping that there's some, uh, maybe some crossover or some, uh, some nutritious connection between these two sets of ideas. And so Haris is going to start us off with a little bit of an introduction and how we might approach linking up some of Gabe's theory with Harris's ideas. <clears throat> Great. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back on the mini code. And it's great to be here with uh, Gabriel, too. Um, I, I feel a great uh, uh, excitement to be able to uh, speak and, uh, let's say, potentially synthesize uh, our uh, proposed models. Uh, we are coming into um, uh, from from different angles, let's say, and from different locations. But as a good friend of mine, uh, Chance uh, said that he's also a follower of of the Meaning Code, and he have watched uh, closely both of our uh, presentations and talks. Uh, there is a lot of uh, common ground there, let's say. So, uh, as they say in 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 both science, but also in, in philosophy, every theory and every toy model, as they call them, uh, it's a conceptual scaffold. So this is what we are trying to do here. We're trying to understand the different structures that uh, each of us is proposing. And uh, just to give a, a, because this is the first time we approach this, and of course, uh, it's in the spirit of uh, good collaboration and uh, experimentation even. So what I I actually thought of uh, to be the, the best way to approach this is to uh, make a, a, a comparison, let's say, between Gabe's model and his 10 aspects that he placed there. Uh, we, can, we will go through them uh, in a while. Uh, alongside with uh, some historical paintings, so uh, the, the rationale behind that is in order to facilitate not only uh, a two-way discussion between myself and Gabriel, but also to, to include you, Karin, into uh, <laughs> our discussion. And uh, we all know that you are not only a podcaster, but you are a great painter. I, I told you I, once again in the past, I love your paintings. So... I really hope that uh, this will uh, allow some room for some novelty to emerge and our good ideas to blend. So that's for me. That's all Absolutely. For me. That sounds terrific. So, um, so uh, I think it's Barbara Tversky who talks about spatial thinking, who says that it's at it's at that edge between things where the ambiguity lies, and that's where you find all the creativity is in the ambiguity. So, so maybe that's what we're going to do here: is find some ambiguity in the in the intervals. So, uh, did you want to start with the first painting, Harris? Yes. Uh, first of all, the first aspect, uh, as per uh, Gabriel's model, is consciousness, and uh, I, I really put a lot of. Uh, uh, effort in, in making this review and I, and I came uh, to the following painting basically it's one of my favorite paintings ever uh, it's from a very famous uh, uh, painter and an engraver uh, Albrecht Dürer and it's called uh, Melancholia number no. one and uh, it's a fascinating uh, engraving uh, it is one that actually uh, it's full of, of symbolism. And in a way, I wanted to start with, uh, with that one, not only because it's, it's the first in uh, ranked, let's say, in Gambrier's model, but also because it is a complete synthesis uh, of different concepts uh, conceptually put, placed together. Uh, there is one great uh, art uh, historian uh, called Erwin Panofsky, who actually said that this painting might actually be the be understood as the 
psychological profile of the of the artist of Durer himself. So this is in a way the 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 effort, the honest effort, let's say, of a polymath like that, uh, like uh, Durer, to incorporate different elements of his uh, vistas, let's say, of consciousness uh, into a single composition. And uh, as we can as we can see here, it's not only uh, the the main figure of that angel sitting there. Uh, it's also the cubit that is the child that sits in the back that actually writes something into a tablet. Um, there is also a variety of, of tools um, that we can see in the in the front. There is also uh, even some uh, asymmetrical polyedra, a polyedron that is there that is called the uh, the polyedron of of Durer. And we can even notice some other aspects, like for example, there is uh, this, let's say this uh, structure over there in the back uh, that includes a ladder, it includes the, uh, the scales, it includes uh, even, even uh, a bell. And this actually reminds me what Gabriel said during your, uh, your uh, talk that at the end of the day, consciousness is well aligned with uh, music. So in a way we can see that uh, this is the role of the of the bell in that painting, uh, that it also incorporates that element into um, the, the composition. Uh, some other uh, elements that can be found there, it's of course, uh, what is called uh, a magic square that is actually uh, right below that um, belt, bell, and uh, interestingly enough, the reason that it is called in such a, a manner, it's because it is composed of uh, uh, a four by four grid. It has sixteen different numbers there, and and if you notice and and analyze a bit that uh, particular uh, square, uh, you come to the following conclusion: uh, when you add the different rows the different columns or even the diagonals, but even if, even if you take different uh, combinations of those 16 squares, like you can take the four edges, for example, and, and many other combinations, you will always arrive to the same uh, sum. And that sum is 34. And uh, this is also, I, I personally believe that it, it has a, a dual aspect, let's say, uh, in it, um, because this uh, uh, this painting is is supposed to, as I said before, to a, a cam a cam encapsulate uh, the whole array of what is consciousness, how the artist understood uh, consciousness in that regard. Uh, there are many uh, elements in that painting, and I can. Uh, go on and, and on and even give a lecture for a 10 hour lecture about that one but uh, I just wanted to uh, touch upon it a bit in order to introduce let's say this uh, different uh, approach into our conversation so I will be delightful to listen to both Gabriel and you Karen. Thank you for that. I really, I really enjoy this picture, and I like the the elements and just as you point them out, um, just how they appear. And I'm I'm drawn, being someone who works with his hands, to the to what appear to be the tools and the nails and the uh, plane at the at the front. And it kind of feels like this this is encapsulating in a way of of the model itself as a whole. And because the, the the part of con this kind of begins with uh, a question, the uh, listen, practice, and believe. So it's almost taking in, if you think of the, the cycle as a whole, uh, taking in what you've learned as you move through that cycle and becoming aware. It's almost like uh, uh, combining all those things to, to develop your awareness and, and how that evolves over time. 
based on what you've learned uh, as you move through the cycle of of understanding, I think is the the first impression I get of that. Does that uh, does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. And in, as you said, uh, it's a type of journey, and maybe it's like a a, a freeze frame that has to do with uh, that particular uh, time in space, let's say, and in a way it tries to capture the the arc of the artist or of the person uh, that uh, is the creator of the model let's say so yeah i think i think too it's almost like the uh the very thoughtful look on the character in the front in the foreground mm -hmm. uh just giving thought and just the collection of things. It's like any individual over time, they, they collect these things that are meaningful that seem to help them de define and understand the world around them, different tools that they use to kind of map things out. And so the it all is very neat, <laughs> somewhat chaotically gathered around them. And it's like they having those things nearby uh, and then giving thought to to what it all, how it all is incorporated, how it all goes together and how you use the different things that you collect over time to help you understand just uh, what it is that, that's going on and, and how to navigate. So so I, I enjoy that one very much. Great. And just a small comment, um, in terms of the John Vervaghi's work that has to do with cognition, and, and I personally find it to be an intriguing, let's say, a proposal. Um, I understand that the basically this co conceptual scaffold, as, as I uh, mentioned it before, is not to be uh, permanent or, or rigid, let's say, but it can actually capture this ephemerality of everything that is going on. So uh, this is also why I, I've mentioned uh, Panofsky's uh, description of this particular engraving by Durer, Durer as this uh, psychological profile or or even cognitive profile of the of the individual. So, that's that's excellent. Yeah, the excellent way to to describe that. Uh, just the unique things that he chose to include in that engraving are 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 indicative of what it what it is that he's thinking about and how he's thinking about things. So I like that very much. Yeah. I like what you mentioned, Harris, when you said that, that not to be permanent or rigid. Mm -hmm. Because um, one of the things I was just reading this morning, I once in a while I take my ideas and I make a big thing like this where I'm trying to work out what the ideas are. And I was looking back over these this morning and I ran into one that says this, to do a perfectly representational painting, you know, it, like, so if you paint something so it looks exactly like a photograph, right? Mm -hmm. Is to represent it at just one moment in time. So it's completely yeah. static, permanent, rigid, right? And um, every choice is made simply to mimic what you are seeing at that moment, but it would no longer be alive. But what the artist does when they're painting or drawing or sculpting something is they're painting time and flexibility into the work. And, and I noticed that he's got the, he's got the scale, the measurement, mm -hmm. he's got the, the uh, timer, the, the, hour glass, yes. the hour, he's got the hourglass, right? And so you have both accuracy and expression. It has the measuring stick. Mm -hmm. and and the nails and uh, the sphere so there's both accuracy and expression there's the there's the the measurement and and all of that but there's also the passion in in the style of it and then the, the other binary that i think is very interesting is something that um matu talks about in his book the the language of creation this difference between stability and completeness you you can't you can't ever have perfect stability and you can't ever have perfect completeness. But the interesting thing that he does is he compares stability to space and completeness to time. And that the completeness of time includes 
because it includes everything, because it's not discrete, it includes everything. So that also includes all of chaos and all of the unknown and all of the multiplicity that can't be differentiated. So, so <clears throat> that, that drawing is, is um, really exploring that space between stability and completeness, I think. If I can, it's kind of interesting because I know that that um, the section that Gabe wanted to approach is where he starts looking at space and time and how the the theories about space and time actually affect the way we think about mass and and other things like that. And before we move to that, if I can expand on your idea of the art, like uh, producing a a perfect version and capturing that almost frozen in time. It is kind of uh, the same sort of dichotomy if you think of that and then the exploratory abstraction of very creative art that is not, you ne can't necessarily draw anything in particular out of it. But in between those two is something that you can recognize, but is also alive. And I think that's the fundamental uh, idea behind what I'm doing is in each one of those tensions, there is an extreme on either side that is not necessarily healthful, healthy or useful in, on its own, but when those those I, those concepts, uh, uh, for example, in artistic expression, are brought together, you get something that really moves you. That is also recognizable. So it's something that you can relate to, but something that also feels alive in that way. So there's that balance between those those two extremes. Well, that's great. That's great points from both of you. Uh, basically, as I understand it, is like. He was trying to capture this, not only the duality, but also the asymmetry that comes along with it. So it's both a symmetry and an asymmetry that that uh, it goes, uh, let's say that it, it dances together in, in an elegant and dance. And it is, uh, let's say the job or the task of the artist or of the theorist or of the, even the scientist to be able to grasp that. And uh, going back to the uh, to the whole journey and the arc, let's say, uh, of the individual that tries to embark upon that uh, explore that journey of exploration, let's say, into the realm of abstract ideas and concepts and even cognition and all those aspects that we will uh, see, let's say, that you highlight beautifully in your model. It has to do, I think, also with the fact that. It's once again, I'm using something from uh, cognitive science here. There, there is the concept of hi hybrid cognition. And hybrid cognition is something that it's, it's the individual, but it's also because the individual has access to some tools. Those tools, in a way, they are an, an extension to the individual. And taking that a step further, our tools shape us too. So we discover something, we play, let's say, around with it, and then that interplay actually shapes the way we think and even the way we approach things. So this is also another aspect that, that I see that and getting captured there. And uh, just a final uh, point, let's say, uh, I, I really can see and with this journey, let's say that we will uh, take now with these uh, paintings, I can see different aspects of your model representing in, in, in various paintings. So it's not like it's something extremely strict, but we can see, let's say the aspects of consciousness also in, in another of those paintings. So it's a very nice, uh, let's say, way to approach this uh, conversation. Uh, no, I really, I really enjoy your idea behind this. This is a great way to proceed. So thank you for that. Great, great. So glad. So, so glad you like. It. So what's number two? Yeah. So number two, uh, once again, I am following the model of uh, uh, Gabriel. Uh, the the second aspect is will, and uh, what I have. Uh, um, um, chosen to showcase here. It's a great painting by Michelangelo. 
and namely the creation of Adam. So once again, this is one of my, uh, not, not only for me, but it's one of the, of the paintings that uh, a lot of people, they, they like and they uh, acknowledge. Uh, it has great value, not only in terms of aesthetics, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, mimetics, like it's uh, a lot of people recognize uh, this one. And uh, uh, I think it has to do with this notion of the will. And when I say will, I am speaking about divine will from the from the uh, part of the of the creator, our creator, that he made the, uh, the this decision to create Adam, but also from the part of Adam, let's say, stretching out to to reach uh, his creator. So this is what I, I I see here happening. Once again, I find this interplay. Uh, between um, the two uh, to be fascinating. And I, I, I really like even the, what Gabriel did with, the, with introducing this extra layer on top of those 10 aspects in terms of the, an alignment with the 10 commandments. So that's also something else that I find uh, really intriguing, let's say, in Gabriel's uh, proposal. And uh, of course, uh, uh, let's say the, the um, it is important to note that uh, the second commandment uh, has to do with not creating any graven images. But this is what I believe uh, Michelangelo tried to actually capture also in, in, in this uh, in fabulous uh, painting and in this conception, let's say, of the creation of Adam. No, I think it I think it's a good good choice. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the way I structured uh, the part, the aspect of will is the inclusive and exclusive. And you think of uh, in the terms of relationship, because uh, in my mind, love love is a measure of will and so when god including adam in in relationship with himself it's it's like a there and then if you look at the way the tensions operate it's a, there's an issue uh, or it's a, a thing of embrace uh integration investment and sacrifice and so it's that that back and forth of the relationship uh is a matter of will because will is an issue of your including someone in including someone in your will is to to invest and make sacrifices for their well-being if your will is based on love uh as opposed to what i think i think of uh, the opposite as betrayal i think the opposite of love is betrayal because it's it's sacrificing others for the sake of your own gain whereas love is sacrificing yourself for the well-being of others and in the story of uh, the bible and uh, in the penultimate uh, appearance of Christ and what he did, that uh, that is the theme that that is there for me when I when I think of these ideas. Great. Uh, uh, yeah, I I really believe that it's it's best for us to worship God, the Creator, and be, not only because He created us. And the, and the and everything, but also because he's everlasting. So it's a relationship that it it moves, it transcends beyond any 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 realm of of understanding. Let's say uh, we have to uh, being able to grasp with our hearts. So it, it, once again, it is all about uh, love. Let's say and the love that. Uh, it's also reciprocal in a profound manner and way. Yes, and I think just coming back again and again to that idea of relationship, it's it's he has created us, he has included us in his will, and we are part of that, and we play a part of it, and we and I do believe we have choices that need to be made as far as 
the specifics of how we how we uh, invest what he's given us back into to performing his will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think we pay a, play a big part of that. And so much of the relationship of will is is turning to the other and investing in the other and sacrificing for the other in order to 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 fulfill the the higher will, as it were. So what do you what do the two of you think about um, the way that Adam is reaching? Could could you is it possible to put it back up again, Gabe? Uh, yep. Give me half a second. Here. Because I mean, a lot of people have looked at that um, distance between the finger of God and the hand of Adam, and speculated about what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need to swipe me off. This. There you go. Okay. Oh. Oh. Hold on. Yeah, we're having some share problems over. here. Apologize. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, um, I think too, the the reaching it's it's reciprocal because it's so much of the Bible talks about God, you know, reaching out to us and and drawing us to Him, and I think, and then calls of people like Paul and, and in the gospels to to respond and so the, you know, what I see out of at least at first glance is is a responsive reciprocal relationship where they're they're reaching I know others have interpreted it as the moment of of life but I, I generally see that as a God talks about breathing life into Adam so this this to me seems more like uh, an indication of the relationship, at least as I would interpret it personally. Yeah, I I also think I I, I tend to agree with uh, Gabriel there. It's all about the reciprocity, let's say, that exists there. One aspect that I would like to highlight is that because this is a fresco painting that is in in on the ceiling of the uh, of the Sistine uh, Chapel. So you can imagine it as when you enter there, you have to look up in order to uh, see it. So in a way, it, it, it captures this, um, this feeling that has to, is associated with, with all. And and it's something that it's it's once again it's you you have to look up to to see it in in yeah. actual terms. So you have to turn. Uh, I'm trying to make the the point there with this uh, that other thing that you said about it. It's also the turning. Yes. You know. Yeah. It's almost as if Adam, after being created, because he is alive at the in the moment of the painting but it's almost as if he's turned back to God and reaching out to him. And so yeah. it's almost like a moment of recognition of the creator, of the need of the individual for that relationship. Um, so I, I really enjoy that. And, and just as a side note, I've always, the looking up, I, I, I really appreciate just the, the way that impresses on me because you think of depression, that's a looking down, that's a looking in, that's a turning in. And that's a, a self-focus that almost seals you into a space where you cannot look up, you cannot look out. And so part of that tension between self and, and the outside, the inside and the outside, which is so fundamental to the way I look at these things, is you have to be able to look up. You have to, be, you have to choose to look up and, and to engage with what is outside you uh, to avoid spiraling down into that that enclosed sphere of depression yeah well the, there's there still remains for me that little thing so god's hand is reaching out and adam's finger is like this all he'd have to do is that and they could touch but it's still like that so there's mm -hmm. some sort of There's a picture there to me of the whole human race and the, the resistance that we have to actually receiving the touch of God on our lives. There's just that 
it's like he's there, he's as close as breathing. And yet we can't make that little move that just that tiny move that would require that finger to just reach out and touch. So to me, that portion of the painting encapsulates just about the whole history of the universe. Now, if you yeah. think of it in the sense of the fall, if, if this, if you maybe place this moment post fall, it's almost like that gap exists and whether it's small or infinite, um, in that gap steps Christ. And that is, that is the connection that is made that draws us back in to that moment of contact with the father. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that gap. yeah that, that's beautiful. By the way, in terms of, uh, my own theory with the master group and, and everything that I try to, to address there, I just want to make a, a very small point. In, in my own theory, I, I had connected the master group with the so-called platonic octavron. And, and what I, I, I realized and I've shared during our first talks with, with Karen is that this platonic form or solid, in a way, it's the ideal form. So, the, the the solid that I I've let's say uh, rediscovered is is not exactly the the idealized form, but is one step before that. So it, it is always trying to reach out to the perfected let's say platform uh, platonic form, but it just it it's, it reminded me what you said, Karen, about this small move that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. there, there is an additional little something that needs to be made in order to reach out to that idealized version. And maybe we can never uh, uh, reach reach it there, but it doesn't mean that it cannot act as a, a guiding star, let's say, towards mm -hmm. towards that. And and the way uh, to to reach, let's say, out, and to try to uh, grasp, let's say, the, the substance of, of the whole uh, issue at hand, I, I would like to move to the, to the next aspect and to the next uh, painting, because it is a, a lovely bridge uh, there. So the third aspect has to do with substance. And uh, the painting that... Uh, I selected to showcase there. Uh, it's not a very well-known painting. Um, it's from a painter uh, that is uh, called, he's called Theodor Aksendowicz. And, and, and the painting is called The Anchorite. So uh, in, in Greek, we have, uh, we use the word anachorites, which is, it means that it's not exactly the, the hermit, let's say, that uh, uh, goes away from the, uh, uh, from the community in order to um, be isolated, but it has to do with a, a slightly different form of uh, the religious person. And, and the pain that here captures uh, one, one such uh, person that he is sitting uh, alone, studying and praying with the scripture. So for me, this is one way to, to approach the, the, the substance, let's say, of what, what it is to be human and to love the creator, uh, God and the Lord and, and everything within this world. And I, I, I'll point out, too, that, that substance is between will and the body. And uh, I think it's just important to note that just the relationship of the things, the things adjacent to the thing as well. So I think that plays in. And then as far as substance, like in the, in the physics of things, the, the idea of the difference between light and darkness. And I like that this painting 
he kind of sits between the light and the darkness. You see the light shining on him and illuminating the text in front of him and the darkness behind him as if uh, looming there. And so he, he has found a space in between where he is, it is not so bright that he cannot see and it's not so dark that he cannot see. So it's that, I think the extreme as it's noted on, on my model of, of substance is uh, disconnect. Like that is the extreme as far as, uh, so if you think if he walks into the darkness, he is disconnected from say the text that is the enlightenment he is seeking. And if he walks too far into the light, he can can no longer see. And so it's that space in between where he's able to live and to grow. And uh, perhaps as your eyes adjust, you are able more and more to move into the light. Maybe that's where the metaphor makes sense. But I think in the space we're in as humans, there's a certain logos as as it's said so often in the, the corner uh, to to balancing those two extremes. Because uh, if you think in the sense of like photons traveling uh, in an expanding space, eventually it ta you talk about things like the heat death, where suddenly space is expanding faster than light can transmit. So there's a disconnect there. So that expanding expanding aspect, and then the opposite would in a sense be the black hole where suddenly there's a contraction so extreme that the disconnect is in the opposite direction where light can no longer transmit because it cannot move beyond that that moment. That's a um, really interesting concept, Gabe, that substance is between the light and the dark. I, um, I've, I've certainly thought of that in terms of art, but I never thought of it in terms of how that would translate into all these other realms but i mean obviously in art the only way you can produce form is with both light and dark mm -hmm. it's just all dark you've got no form if it's all light you've got no form but but between the two there's many 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 different ways that you can produce form and uh that that's a really interesting to see how that the consilience idea, Harris, how that consilience idea works through all the different scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, honestly, it's it's indeed a great point, uh, Gabriel, and I agree with uh, with Karen fully. And maybe it has to do with this inner teleology, let's say, this intense prayer that arises there, that. In between what you say, the darkness and the brightness, that is just the right amount to allow uh, that to, to, to happen. In a way, it is, how to call it? Once again, I, I tend myself to look back to this uh, reciprocity that, that it's they are also present in the previous uh, painting with the creation of Adam. It's like, it's, it's an act of will uh, at the end of the day, but the, the environment that it takes place is the created envir environment that was created for us. So in a way, this, is, this uh, let's say, intense form of, of praying or of studying the, the sacred text, and once again, encapsulates this urge of being being grateful, let's say, uh, for the gift of life uh, that was granted granted to Adam, to and to all of us, let's say. And uh, well, one other thing I'd like to throw in there, um, and I think this ties together, Gabe, your idea of of seeing, and um, the idea of. Uh, well, the tensions that produce the relationships, um, going back to to all of the things that we've talked about, is that in, in art, we talk about value and how to use value. So you can use value to produce form, light and dark. And obviously, if you, if you have just the perfect balance of light and dark, you can recreate, you know, form so that it, the way, um, 
Michelangelo does it, you can perfectly see the forms and the muscles and the shadows and, and all of that. Um, you can equally do this if you get even down into the very dark values. Let's say you have something that ranges from a, a middle gray to black. Even if that's all you have to work with, you can still create form, but it's going to be more ambiguous when you look at it. Likewise, if your values are all up in the very high light, bright values, say between a one and a three, between pure white light and some sort of luminescent glow that you might have at the edge of a rainbow, you can still create form with that, but it's going to be more ambiguous. So when you are seeing in those ranges where the, where the range is very small range, when you see within that range, you have to make a choice of how you interpret it. And, and I think that fits in with this whole idea of even going back to the original drawing that we were looking at, where he has all the tools for measurement. I think it go, all of these things somehow, when I start reading the scriptures now, I'm finding so much about measurement that's in there. But mm -hmm. measurement can never be perfect because we're unable, as as uh, as Haris was saying earlier about how you can get right to the edge of something, but it's not the perfect thing. You can come right to the edge of a of a measurement, but it's never going to be exactly precise because of the world we live in. So there's always this ambiguity that you have to make a choice of what you see. And there's always a cost to that choosing. If I see this and not that, then I'm giving up all of that in order to see this. So when he's kneeling there at the hay bale um, in his uh, probably very rough camel hair wrapping in, in this probably cold and mostly dark place, He's choosing to see that and not see all the other things around him. Yes. And it's that choice that has a tremendous cost. Going back to your number two, Gabe, the whole thing about will, how love is a measure of will. Um, and that has to include integration and investment and sacrifice. And that's what's happening too in that painting is that he is allowing the word to be integrated into his life. He's investing himself in that. He's sacrificing in order to have that embrace of, of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and then just, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but I liked what you were saying about form. And I think just to make a note of that, um, the, the relationship between substance and form, the bodies in between. So if you think of painting, what you're not, you're not necessarily, and this is, may have something to do with semantics and how I use the word, but I don't see it as using the substance and, and painting the form. The form is what informs the body. So what you're seeing in the picture, what you're seeing in the image is the body. And what is informing that is the, the, the substance that makes up the body and the form that, that gives you almost the instructions or the I don't even know what the form, the form is really the word for it. Form informs the body. And so what you're, what you're seeing and what you're interacting with, which, which makes sense because what we interact with most directly is our body. And whereas substance and form are, are slightly more abstract in that sense. And they are, they're coming together. And this is a theme throughout this, the, the model that I have is the the two things adjacent to the one in the center as you as you kind of move along the cycle emerges almost emerges as a result of the interaction between the two so if you think of uh substance and form as a laminar flow if you have two laminar laminar flows flowing along together there is no communication between them by nature of uh, fluid dynamics but in order to communicate and to stir up between those two there's there's a turbulent flow that has to take place in between them. And suddenly you have communication between those laminar flows. So you could think of the idea of substance, space, and time as a laminar flow and, and form the masculine feminine as a, the, the, that as, each aspect is a laminar flow and body is the communication between them. And the thing, and it, it, it and it falls together well that the body is also a mo motor aspect. It's an outward working aspect. It's an aspect that we interact with 
I think more directly and that we're, we're more aware of just because it's so present to us. If that, if that uh, is clear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really like what you said, Gabe, about the, the form in forms. So in a way, this is a, a, a notion, let's say that I can see it in various scales as, as Karen pointed out uh, um, before. And uh, from even from the macroscopic to the mesoscopic, but also even to the microscopic that has to do with the with the quantum scales, let's say. So uh, in in a, in a way, and, and now I'm trying to make this uh, allow me to make this small bridge with with uh, with science, uh, because we we uh, also we are courageous enough to also talk about that aspect exactly. So. In terms of thermodynamics, let's say, uh, at least this is how I understand it. It is a combination of 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 two two concepts that are coming together in order to give us a uh, let's say the the notion of useful work. Basically, it's uh, uh, free energy that actually combines potential energy along with entropy. So, and these two together, let's say. They they give rise to what is uh, what we call maximum maximum useful work. So I really find it fascinating that what is that maximum useful work at the macroscopic scale? M maybe it's prayer. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So you know, that's my 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 two cents. Uh, sometimes uh, I think to myself that we are all embedded into the same uh, system and uh, in a way uh, we, are, we are all trying our best to navigate, let's say, within that very same uh, limitations that apply to everyone, to all of us. So uh, yeah. I, maybe, I like, yeah. oh, sorry, I didn't cut you off there no no, no. It's, it's okay it's okay i really it that that mentioning prayer as the macroscopic that really tickles my intuition i'm gonna have to give that some serious thought because because it is it's almost you think of being at your lowest low you're reaching to the highest high and so the greatest expanse that exists between the the greatest distance that exists is prayer because you're reaching up to something far beyond your your uh your own little space that you exist in so that that really tickles my my intuition as i said so i'm gonna have to jot that down and give that some thought thank you <laughs> great what popped in my head just there is a message i heard the other day or maybe i was reading it about how job is actually a a another type or shadow of Christ because Job was at the time living the most um the most righteous life when when God is talking about him he says consider my servant Job you know he's living this righteous life and then he suffers the the most uh, undeserved fate right so it's an extreme. It's a huge extreme. But then Christ's extreme is even more extreme because he was not only the most righteous man, he is perfect, you know, absolutely perfect. And yet he suffers the most extreme punishment. And so so that extreme is even larger. And uh, well, if you think of it in terms of of the if you think of it in terms of extremes which is another fundamental aspect of of how i interpret things if you if you look at the person of christ it's almost that he was pulled apart by those extremes he was the logos he was perfect as you say he fulfilled the law in the way that he lived but in order to gather things back together and to restore what was lost at the fall you if you think of it spatially he would, in a sense, have to reach into infinity on either side of those extremes, outward to the extreme and inward to the extreme to take hold of the ends and draw them back together, 
which you can think of as being pulled apart, which is the death and the sacrifice, and then the resurrection, which is drawing, taking hold of those things in the farthest points and drawing them back together, and that that being the resurrection. Uh, so that's the that's the kind of image that that comes to mind for me when I think about what you just said. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so do we want to move on to number four? Yes, yes. Uh, a small, a small comment to the to the previous one, because it's, it's I find it fascinating. You know, the the the, the Lord cast uh, two titles, uh, um, God the Son and and the Son of Man. So he combines both both of those. Um, attributes let's say uh, and and maybe it sounds uh, paradoxical but that's how it 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 is and and it is an act of of faith let's say on behalf of the of the faithful to be able to, comp to contemplate and and into that uh, let's say uh, regime yeah <laughs> Great. So, uh, moving forward. Well, before uh, we leave that, I just have to say that's such a perfect picture of complete perfect light and complete perfect darkness. But the it's the holding the two together that creates the the body, the body of Christ, right? Because be, God the Son is something that we can't. We can't we can't see that because it's all light, and and the Son of Man, we're not very good at seeing that because we're also part of the darkness, so we're in the darkness trying to see the darkness, and so we're not very good at that. But but because the, because he was willing to be pulled apart to to hold both of those together, that creates a form that we can see and that we can uh, worship and. The way, the way I kind of think about that is is kind of the way God relates to us in His different forms. You think of the the triune nature, and I know that's kind of a contentious topic sometimes in this in the corner. But if you think of the triune nation uh, nature, like how how do we interact with the dis different roles of God? And and it's almost if God the Father is outside us, the Spirit of God is within us as believers, and Christ is alongside us. So it's almost as if uh, God is that outside, the spirit is that inside, and Christ is the surface between that is the the logos, the interaction between the two, the balancing of those two extremes in that sense. So that's kind of how, how I approach that, at least on a very elementary level. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you both. Now, moving, moving to the next one, uh, we have the body from a, one a really fascinating painter, Rembrandt. Um, many people know about uh, this one. I, I'm not so certain if they also are aware of this particular painting. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, this painting is called The Anatomy Lesson by Nicholas Talp. And uh, the, the reason that I included it here is because it reminds me of the clay nature of our bodies. And uh, there is a lesson there to be learned, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, not only humility, but also of propagating, let's say, uh, the knowledge of the, of the previous generation onto the next ones. So... We made this move and this transition from the substance that is really, really difficult to grasp, but via prayer and when we allow room for the for the mind to dip into our hearts, maybe we can uh, intuit, let's say, and even grasp uh, uh, this paradox, this great paradox, and we move into something that is way more uh close to us in terms of our own body and in in the same manner as we said before 
in terms of the of the Lord, maybe even even not maybe even if he was the uh, and got the got the son, still he got crucified on the cross, and he had this uh, uh, human, let's say, uh, fate uh, that 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 happened. Of course, we know later on that uh, he got resur resurrected, and the faithful ones they they believe into the resurrection of the dead, so. Uh, in in an effort to put everything together, I offer to you this uh, painting that is is stands uh, as the title says as a humble lesson. Let's say uh, to everyone, in order to remind us our uh, uh, clay like nature, let's say, and fragile nature that we'll have. I, yeah, I, I like that. I think to to kind of expand on that, I I'm struggle against the the ideas of I think you find in certain practices or or perspectives of Christianity that the body is not of the same value as say the substance or the will or consciousness or values it, themselves. Like it, it's almost if that's something you know, in the flesh, something dirty or filthy. And though it can be, and I think any aspect of our being can become that way, that kind of filth in its own particular realm. Uh, but the body, the body itself is is an integral and important aspect of mm -hmm. who who we are and what makes us up. And like you said, the frailty and it it the the, the commandment it's connected to is that you should not murder. And in my mind it's the body is the connection to to the substance and to the form between the substance and form and it, it is the thing almost a, a manifestation of our being in its clearest its clearest and most interactive way and so i think every in the same way that the other aspects can fall out of balance and become unhealthy and unfit uh we see that in a physical example as we we exist in our own bodies and deal with our own bodies and try to maintain and and care for our own bodies and you'll see the one of the dichotomies in the model is fitness and illness and it's it's a, it's a, it's a constant struggle of tension to maintain that space because even you think of being too fit and depriving yourself of certain indulgences that are necessary for just the the general flourishing of the body uh, to to achieve a goal, some extreme goal, and you live on the edge of death in that way. And then on the other end, to to overindulge in the things that are not necessarily required or needed uh, puts you in that same situation where you you exist on the edge of death. So it very much in in the theme of what you said, just exposing the frailty, but at the same time giving us an example to see more clearly how the different aspects of our being uh, work just based on how our bodies work. So we can look at our body and have an understanding of how perception works or even how morality works just based on that, that tension between those dichotomies of, of uh, fitness and illness. Um, so. Thank One of you, the things I find, if, if you could leave the painting up, Gabe, for a second, okay. I want to talk about something in the painting because I find this really fascinating. Look at uh, look at the trajectory of their eyes. Mm. And if you look at the right hand corner, down in the lower right hand corner, there's a book. And everybody except for one guy is looking, well, two guys. The the I believe that's Rembrandt doing the the uh, dissection. Is that correct? If I'm not mistaken, that's the uh, first of all. This was one of the um, of the of the earlier early paintings of Rembrandt, 
uh, it is considered one of his early masterpieces, let's say. I see. And, and the person depicted there, it's 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 the one mentioned in the in the title. This uh, Nicola Stalp. Oh, okay. That okay. he was an actual doctor. And another important aspect here is that uh, the group of of those uh, uh, people, uh, let's say, participating in these lessons, they are all doctors. And some of them, they actually paid money to Rembrandt to be included in that painting. So that's another aspect that also has to do with this uh, proclivity towards fame, let's say, that uh, we human beings sometimes have. So. Well, so the, the six guys on the left are all looking at the book. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah. And then the seventh guy, the one that's right next to Dr. Nicholas, whatever his name is, he's yeah. looking at the painter. Yeah. That's fascinating, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So you 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 often see this in a lot of these old paintings where there'll be one person in the frame that's looking at at the painter or looking at the viewer. It could be huh? making to, to, so that the viewer, when they're looking at this painting, they feel a connection with the painting because that one guy is looking. I see that guy looking at me, and yeah. that gives me an automatic connection to the painting. So I want to explore the painting and see what it's about. But all those uh, other like guys are looking at the book. This guy is right there doing this dissection for you guys, but they're not looking at the body. Yeah. They're looking at the book. So yeah. can is there any way if you're looking at the original painting that you can tell what that book is? Is it an anatomy book or is it a, the Bible or what? What is that book? <laughs> uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't know. I I always thought that it was a really important uh, book, and it had to do with. You know, in in my head, it, it was like a. Uh, one of the works of uh, uh, anatomy, let's say. But uh, I, I like this uh, perspective that you give there. Maybe maybe there is, uh, we need to in, investigate a bit further into that one. Well, even if it is a book of anatomy, what it's really saying is we are like that. We are, we are more attentive to, we're often more attentive to something that's in a book than we are to the actual thing that's right in front of us. And uh, yeah. I think it's pretty, in that these guys that painted these things, they weren't just, this all wasn't just some, oh, I'm gonna throw together a painting. They had this stuff all thought out before they started, you know? Yeah. There's, there's a lot deeper message in all these works, so. <clears throat> Fascinating. Uh, uh, Karen, I remember when you uh, were discussing your own theory that it has to do this aspect with uh, uh, what, you, what you mentioned before, uh, a particular element that stands out for some reason. Maybe it's color, maybe it's some other, uh, uh, let's say, aspect in the painting. And in this case, is that uh, one individual that actually looks at the at the viewer in a way in breaking the fourth wall? I don't know how to uh, to call that one. Yeah, yeah. it feels um, like it feels like kind of as you said, Karen, an, an invitation, almost as if it's asking you to respond to what it is that they're doing uh, as he looks at you, and then mm -hmm. even the guy in the top left, he's almost looking past you, so it's almost. Like the the thought that comes to mind is when someone looks behind you is for you to consider like where you are, but uh -huh. also where they are. And then the one looking at you is almost, there's almost a, a feeling of expectation that he is is inviting you to respond to what it is that's going on in front of you. And so. Well, there's two things that I think the artist wants us to look at in this painting. One of them is the reason that that, it, it may be that the reason that that guy captured my attention is that it's pointing me to all the other guys. This guy's looking at me. What are all those other guys looking at? And then that leads me to the book. Yeah. So that book is just hiding down there in the corner. But for some reason, the artist wants me to look at that book. 
Yeah. That book's there for a reason. It's not just there for an eye stopper, although it's a very convenient eye stopper because painting painters will often paint something in the lower right-hand corner to keep the viewer from just sweeping off that corner and going on to the next painting, something that keeps you in the frame. And that book down there certainly keeps you in the frame, but the painter wanted us to notice that book. And the other thing that the painter wanted us to notice is that if you'll notice that painting, there's almost no color in the painting. It's all very, very neutral. But you see the the life that's the the blood, the color that's still in the flesh of that arm that's been flayed open. Yeah. So the 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 uh, the dissection itself is the most vivid part of the painting. You see the, the 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 doctor doing the dissection is wearing black. So that captures your eye because none of the other guys are wearing black. So that black is kind of a backdrop to that vivid red that's happening there in the arm. So so that's what's to capture your attention are those two things. And then the secondary thing is your eye gets led around to that book that's down in the lower right hand corner. That that strikes a thought in my mind when you the way you've just stated it. To think of the book, it's it's like it is the it is the memory it is written down it is the study that has come before them and it's it it seems them all looking at it is is referring to the memory that that is there the scientific memory among them as they look into the reality of the human body so it's almost like here's here's our map of it as we've seen it up to this point, but let's measure again against the reality of the anatomy. Uh, that, you, that's it right there, yeah. You can only capture so much because you have to give up so much in order to write something down. And then once it's written, you have to revisit its source in order to refine your understanding. So that, that's mm -hmm. the way you put it, uh, just brought that thought to me. Yeah, I, I like that. They they're they are getting a choice between the map and the reality. And at least in the moment that that painting is is capturing, they're choosing the map rather than the reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, that, that's a great point. It actually in in my head, uh, two things popped up. One is uh, one technique that comes from a. Uh, 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 let's say uh, adventure films. They, they used to have a, m many of the, particularly of the old adventure films, they used to have uh, a, a device called the Mac, Mac, MacGuffin. Oh. That it was, yeah, <laughs> that it was actually, let's say, a, a particular type of uh, uh, object uh, that it was introduced into the plot as uh, as the device, let's say, to move the the story forward, um, Hitchcock uh, used used it a lot. Uh, that particular device. So uh, my the first idea is that the book actually uh, operates within the painting in that particular uh, manner, in a similar manner, let's say, in order to drive, let's say, the eye movements or the journey. Uh, of, of the viewer into mm -hmm. looking into the uh, Rembrandt's painting. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the second thing uh, is something that once again comes from uh, uh, John Verbeke. Maybe the book is a psychotechnology and, and it gets exemplified in, into that particular composition by Rembrandt. Like the book is, is actually serves there and, and, and it has a, pl a special place, even in something uh, as, as uh, uh, serious uh, as uh, an, an anatomy lesson. So it's, it's not only there in order to uh, give out uh, knowledge, but also to add this, uh, uh, let's say, layer of, of the uh, Psycho this psychological layer, let's say, uh, on top of everything else uh, that is uh, into I think it, in, in my own mind, as you say that, the book, and as Karen described it, it almost, I like that it was a book because it kind of put the, it, it almost introduced the narrative. Uh, and so, it, as you say, a MacGuffin, it, it's 
it, it both introduced and moved along the narrative, you start to develop a story of what's going on based on the fact that they're all so intently referencing this book. So it is, it is, does seem to be a focal point, even despite being down at the right, it, it draws you into the story. And mm -hmm. so. And, and maybe oh, wow. why it is considered a, a masterpiece, let's say, because it okay. has all, all that uh, compacted there. Uh, Rem Rembrandt is among my favorites. <laughs> Great, great. So, well, so I have a suggestion to make. I don't, we're not going to get through all 10, but we do have time for one more. So maybe we can get through the first five. And then if we decide later on that, that you have time, Harish, we could do the other five at another time because I'm finding this particularly fascinating. <laughs> and I hope it's helpful, Gabe, for, for you to kind of see a new aspect to some of uh, your work as well. No, absolutely. Uh, I've really appreciated Harisa's approach to this because it is unique to what I would have introduced myself and it and it's allowed this very organic and interesting conversation to come together and so so I, I'm really enjoying this and if if you do find time Harisa I'd absolutely be happy to continue this as a second second part at some point so yeah I, I will be delightful uh, to do that I will be delighted to uh, to do that with both of you and uh, it also uh, gives me something uh, into my own own theory. So uh, this is, uh, it goes uh, th all, all three ways, let's say. This is beautiful. So yeah, uh, let's continue to the final one there, the fifth one. And uh, here we, uh, we have a slight, uh, I don't want to say departure uh, from what we have seen so far. But uh, it will it will make sense uh, as we approach this. Basically, uh, this fifth uh, aspect of uh, Gabriel's model is uh, form. And in the past, we've we've discussed uh, in this conversation uh, about the idealized forms. So uh, actually, what I did, um, inspired also by uh, Gabriel's model, we have the feminine archetype, let's say, of the form. And we also have the masculine. So uh, in this first painting, we actually uh, approach the, uh, the, uh, the femininity, uh, the feminine uh, form. And of course, we have here one of my uh, personal favorites is the birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. And uh, you can see the whole uh, uh, composition being inspired heavily by um, in Greek mythology. And uh, you, I, I cannot think of, of uh, any other, uh, let's say, uh, figure from, from mythology that exemplifies the, the feminine form of beauty other than goddess Aphrodite. Uh, of course, now we, are, we moved even uh, before, let's say, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the introduction of the um, AD and way before that. But I, I wanted to uh, present this uh, particular painting by Botticelli in order to facilitate this discussion in terms of form and also in terms of archety archetypal forms. So may maybe you want uh, to also show the, the masculine one, Gabriel, and we okay. can discuss yeah. both of them, yeah. Yes. Uh... So for the masculine one is a painting from uh, Charles uh, uh, Manier. Uh, it depicts uh, Apollo. And uh, the title of, of the painting is Apollo, God of Light, Eloquence, Poetry, and the Fine Arts. And just a small, uh, uh, let's say, uh, additional detail here. 
there is also a feminine figure in this particular composition, and it is one of the nine muses, namely it's it's Urania, and she was the she is she was the muse of astronomy. So you can see her there uh, having her hands on top of a of a sphere. So we can also see this uh, figure of the of the feminine also depicted into that particular composition. Oh, and, and and Apollo, of course, was the uh, the 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 god of uh, music too. So we can see him there vaulting also a lyre. Oh. Um, the matter of form is. I think the greatest contention I have with with me, I don't know if you would say this little corner entirely, but certainly with people like Jordan Peterson, he often talks of the feminine form as the chaotic and the masculine as the ordering. And I, uh, I actually take the opposite view. Um, and I have many reasons why that is. But for example, just noting these these paintings if you you see the strength of apollo he's reaching out and if you think of the masculine it is it is a going out and coming in it is an exploration and a, a gathering up to bring in and it is the the feminine that molds and makes and builds the home and the space within and so it is the relationship between the two of them the masculine out mastering the chaotic and the feminine forming the the order in the home or uh, however you like to look, or even in her body, it's the, the masculine from outside enters in and within her, she forms new creation in the form of a child. So I make, take a an opposite view as far as as far as those positions uh, with masculine and feminine. And, and the same thing with the the painting of Aphrodite, you look at, uh, she's she's coming out of this very, very geometric, this shell, very geometric, very ordered, and emerging out of the the ocean and to the to the right is the wilderness. So it's almost like the order is is center, it's it's focal, it's it is uh delicate and to pre be preserved, and you see two the the woman on the right covering her over and 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 protecting her and so that's kind of uh the differences i have when it when it comes to that the ideas of form and what those are uh just just kind of out of the gate that that is my impression and it's certainly my greatest contention with uh with peterson uh, in particular on that matter so i'd be curious uh, what y'all y'all think about that Okay. Um, what yeah. pops into my mind immediately is when Gabe, when you were talking about the woman molding and making the space within, <clears throat> certainly the woman's body <clears throat> is the body that's used to to uh, to weave the infant together in the womb, right? And um, so I can certainly see that picture, but I also I remember this conversation that Ian McGilchrist and Peterson had like five years ago, where the Gilchrist was talking about the two different hemispheres of the brain <clears throat> and how even with birds, they have these two hemispheres where one hemisphere is used specifically for being aware of all the chaos that's around and um, being aware of where the dangers lie and having this broad and open view and then the other hemisphere being very, very focused and specific in order to grab or, or to get the one grain of wheat that is in amongst the gravel pieces, uh, very specific focus. And when those guys talked about the two hemispheres, I saw very clearly that there's some sort of connection between the left hemisphere and the masculine way of looking at the world and the, uh, and I mean, archetypal, 
I don't mean all men. I mean, just the archetypal masculine way of looking at the world. And then the right hemisphere, much closer to the archetypal female way of looking at the world. The archetypal female is always aware of where the danger is to protect and nurture their, their infants. And so in that picture with uh, Botticelli, the, the other woman standing there, she's aware that, that the wind, I don't know which uh, Greek figure is represented by the wind there. He's blowing the cold wind on her. And so she needs to be covered by this. It's a female that's there to cover her. That female is aware. There's chaos there. There's cold. Um, I need to protect. I need to nurture. And so, so that is how I think when Jordan Peterson talks about the archetypal female being um, more connected to chaos, it's this plus, plus, it's this idea that a woman creates chaos in a man, especially young men. When they meet a woman that that they're really attracted to, their brain just turns into chaos instantly. They're not capable of, of forming a sentence. Yeah. Can I? So, <laughs> yes, you can well, jump in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the way I, I think of it is in terms of de civilization. If you think of domestication and exploration, the domestication, what she's doing is she's covering up. It's it's not that she's not aware. It's that she is aware and it it's it's protecting and forming that that boundary around mm -hmm. the feminine. So the feminine takes the space of the in the inside, the inner, the order. Mm -hmm. It is the thing that is maintained is the nurturing. And whereas the man is is the guard outside the tent, the guard on the wall, the, the awareness of the threat, the one yeah, who answers absolutely. the door. So it's not that one is specifically entirely one or the other, because yeah. you have that you have that tension between them. So they both um so so like in the feminine, <clears throat> she twists outward. Uh, to to invigorate. So that chaos you talk about in the man, she she invigorates a man and mm -hmm. And the man turns inward to initiate with the woman. And that initiation is that tension between them. And that tension that between them is what mm -hmm. creates new life. So that is the balancing and the, the perpetuating thing. So if you think of it in terms of a cycle, it is the man and the woman coming together to form that beneficial tension, which continues the cycle of humanity. So, so even in those paintings, I see her being wrapped up and protected and him reaching out. And mm -hmm. so that's... So the subtlety is different and something I struggled with for a long time because it is a common view and especially of late to to think of those things in that way. But I don't I don't think that's quite right because of the way they interact. It's not that the woman does not turn out. It's not that she's not aware. It's not that the man does not turn in, but it's that they occupy that inner and outer space. And it's the turning into one another that creates the balance, creates the tension, creates the perpetuation, creates the new life. That is the creative force between them. And it's just a matter of their their orientation inward and outward. So that's how I, now, I, I like well I think what you're doing is creating a, a beautiful balance because if you if you look at like you said the woman molds and makes and builds the space within and within the house. And the man in many ways molds and makes and builds the space without. He's the one that builds the house. The woman fixes the space inside the house. He's the one that that um, ha that takes the the uh, the questions and the unknown and uh, gathers from the woman. The woman the the I'm saying woman here. What I really mean is the the creative aspect of the right hemisphere of the brain is gathering the information and then passes it on to the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere takes that information and analyzes it and uses it to build constructions and to code and to make machinery. And it's not, I mean, a woman can also do that, but it tends to be more the men that really get off on doing that kind of thing. And uh, so, yeah, it's never a perfect comparison between men and women and the, and the left and right hemispheres of the brain. But there is something there, I think, about these two pictures. So if the woman builds within, the man builds without. And if the if the woman is um, is reaching out and invigorating, the man is reaching in and invigorating. So 
it's it's a balance that's working both ways with those things. So I think yeah. you've come up with a terrific picture there of how that tension. Yeah, if I can I give you a, a, a like an extremely simple analogy of, of how I think of it, it's like the man goes out and hunts, makes a kill, brings in the animal, and she processes it into clothing and food, returns the food and the clothing to the man, which allows him to continue to move further out and to gather more. And so it's that that flow of resources from drawing in resources and exploring and mapping and understanding, drawing in those resources, those resources being formed into something useful that in return are passed back out. So it's that, that dynamic between the left and right hemisphere that has to exist in order to be effective and, mm -hmm. and to move in this world. You have to You have to take in, but you also have to turn what you take into use into something useful so that you continue continue forward so so i i yeah. appreciate your answer. yeah okay th this is fabulous uh, i have a, a a few things to to add here uh gabriel can we have the first painting with the feminine with uh yes Bas basically here uh I just want to, to give some uh, details uh, around those uh, uh, two paintings. Uh, first of all, according to the to the myth, uh, the goddess Aphrodite, got, she got born and she arised out of the foam, let's say, in, in this form. So she came out, she came out and she emerged as a full grown woman. So she she has assumed this form from the very beginning, and the the couple that we see on on, on one side is actually uh, the the person personification of uh, the west wind that is uh, Zephyr. Um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers they have a a song uh, uh, that includes that. Uh, uh, line in the lyrics, let's say. So that's the the most uh, uh, gentle and the most favorable of the of the winds, let's say. And along with him, you have uh, the 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 other female figure that is the aura. Okay, so aura with a u r a. So it's the, the that that aura. And on the other side, you have aura, that is the hour. So uh, it actually re is written as H-O-U-R. So uh, the, the hour of spring that uh, um, she carries this mantle, let's say there, um, uh, to protect her, was one of the, of the of the followers of the of the goddess Aphrodite, so you have this very uh, uh, extremely delicate uh, uh, composition of many different um, elements that uh, come together in this uh, particular uh, painting, and and of course we have the uh, the sea, we have the shell, and 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 all the all the rest, so. You you bringing in the the aspect of nature makes me think of a uh, another uh, another thing. Uh, the way I think Peterson often describes nature as the chaotic, but in my mind, nature delivers us things in order. You have the seasons, you have the cycles, and then when something catastrophic happens, we call that an act of God. So it's like nature has its its times and its seasons and its order and its flowering and it's fruiting and it's it's uh it's harvest and and we call the the chaos the act of god so again in my in my mind i see that feminine mother nature against the masculine aspect of god that that is is more a chaotic uh force whereas nature seems to to perpetuate the order of things so that that uh as you bring that in that's what what uh sparked in my mind mm -hmm. And uh, something on, on what you just said, even, even to this day, but also for the ancient uh, uh, 
and Greeks, let's say, and, and the Romans and, and all the other, they, they always associated the wind with randomness. And even today, when we start speaking about uh, random number generators, uh, in, in a very great extent, we are utilizing the, the actual wind in order to generate those uh, uh, randomness, let's say. Uh, a lot of people, they say there is no real randomness found in, in nature, but the closest thing that we have to it is actually the wind. So uh, that, that's one, of, one aspect. And the other one, it has to do with this, what you said about the seasons. It's, it's what we said, uh, what they call, the, it's not about time, it's about the right time. And this is what they call keros. So this is what is the chaotic. It just so happened at the exact uh, um, uh, right time, let's say. So once again, we can see this uh, uh, um, composition as being uh, a still, let's say, out of the imaginal time that uh, this event uh, took place. And it was a watershed event because it was the birth of beauty in, in that particular uh, cosmo conception um, in, in terms of mythology. I, I really enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs> and, this, and... Is, this has been a, a whirlwind trip through uh, history and art and science and cognitive, um, cognitive, what? philosophy, cognitive ideas. So um, I really enjoyed it. I wish I had more time, but I've got a workman coming to the house very shortly. So got to be sure that I've got the dog locked away and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you as always, Karen. I have I just really enjoy the way you approach these things and just your, your interest and your openness. So, and Haris as well, thank you so much for approaching my ideas in this way um it, it it's helping me in a big way to communicate because for so many years now i've done this alone and though i've interacted with videos and podcasts in my own space to actually have the conversations and and to receive the first impressions and to hear your perspectives allows me to to better triangulate now that i have <laughs> more more ways of looking at the the thing that I've stared at for so long. So this is really, uh, I'm very grateful and this has been really meaningful for me. Great. It, it's sort of evidence for what Paul Vanderclay said the other day that Haris is the great encourager of the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree with that. <laughs> Thanks to so, both of you. This was and and Haris, I'm also looking forward to hearing an update on your paper because you were going to get that paper published. Has that happened yet? Yeah, uh, actually, in the next uh, two months, I th I believe everything is going to uh, go uh, great. So okay, perfect. Well, I'll get back with you in in uh, May, maybe about that. But in the meantime, we'll look forward to part two of this because one through five has certainly been fascinating. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time and, and uh, willingness to talk about these things at a deep level. Have a great weekend. Bye -bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.